Cases 90044, State of Kansas v. Reginald Dexter Carr, Jr. Deborah Wilson from the Capital Appeals and Conflicts Office appears on behalf of the defendant, Appellant Reginald Carr. With me on the brief at the council table is Reed Nelson of the same office. Justices, Kim Parker representing the State of Kansas, the District Attorney's Office in Sedgwick County. May it please the court, David Loudon, Assistant District Attorney, appearing at council table with Ms. Parker. May it please the court, Assistant District Attorney Leslie Isherwood, appearing on behalf of the State of Kansas at council table with Kim Parker. Counsel, you may proceed. May it please the court, I'm Deborah Wilson representing the defendant, Appellant Reginald Carr. Justice Ness, I'll be requesting five minutes rebuttal time today. Five minutes is granted. Thank you. I hope to reach at least three issues with the court today. The third party evidence issue, the Batson issue, and the joint trial issue, and of course any other issues that this court wishes to discuss. The third party evidence issue involves the trial court's application of the third party evidence rule, as well as the hearsay rule, to limit Reginald's proposed testimony so extensively that we contend it deprived him of his fundamental right to testify on his own behalf and his fundamental right to present a full and complete defense to the capital and associated crimes. These evidentiary rulings gutted Reginald's defense and they were wrong. Can you explain what that evidence was? Yes, Your Honor. Just for the court's reference, Reginald made a written proffer, which I reproduced for the court in Appendix 4. But the proffered, well, first let me tell you what the nature of his defense was. Reginald's defense- Well, where I'm getting to is I understood that he wanted to get this information in through the testimony of the girlfriend and that- That's actually- There's some question as to whether she would actually testify. So where I'm getting at, was the evidence really there before we get heartburn about excluding it? Was it there? That's actually a separate issue, Your Honor. You're referring to evidence that didn't come in because Jonathan interposed a Bruton objection. That's actually our third issue. That's the joint trial issue. That's the specific trial right that we say, one of the specific trial rights that was violated by forcing Reginald to stand trial with Jonathan. But that's a completely different issue. With regard to the third party evidence issue, I'll go ahead and answer your question about that. The nature of Reginald's defense to the capital crimes and to the associated crimes that he was misidentified as Jonathan's companion into the Birchwood residence and that it was another person working with Jonathan who actually committed those crimes. In support of that defense, and once again, I'll refer you to Appendix 4 that has the written proffer reproduced in it. In support of that defense, Reginald, not the girlfriend, Reginald, would have testified that he wasn't with Jonathan when the crimes occurred. He received some frantic phone calls during the evening of December 14th and early morning hours of December 15th. During the course of those phone calls, Jonathan made incriminating statements to him, incriminating both himself and another man in these crimes, and that Reginald eventually went to Jonathan's aid. When Reginald met Jonathan with the other man that Jonathan had referred to, those two had the property stolen from the Birchwood residence. Then Reginald agreed, after the fact of the Birchwood crimes, to help the men by concealing the property that they had stolen. I think the easiest way to explain why this evidence that Reginald proffered was not prohibited by the third party evidence rule is to quote this court's decision in State v. Evans. In Evans, the court said, circumstantial evidence that would be admissible and support a conviction if introduced by the state could not be excluded by a court when offered by the defendant to prove his or her defense that another killed the victim. Reginald's defense to the capital crimes and the associated crimes fits the Evans test. 
if the state were prosecuting an individual for a home invasion if the state had a witness who could testify that shortly after the home invasion the defendant called him requesting his help in making incriminatory statements and the witness then met the defendant somewhere and the defendant and another person had the stolen property in their possession there would be absolutely no impediment to the admission of this evidence and whether or not the defendant's companion had been identified or apprehended the witness would be able to testify that he saw the defendant's companion with his own eyes as reginald would have testified and he would be able to testify as to the defendant's statements incriminating both himself and the companion that the witness heard with his own ears there Counsel, be... what about the formulation of the third party evidence rule as we've discussed it in our recent cases since the trial of this case? It's slightly different, isn't it? It's right. talked about motive plus. Exactly, exactly. And of course, Reginald wasn't offering any sort of motive evidence. What that would look like, Justice Beyer, in this case, because I was thinking, what sort of evidence would be prohibited by the third party evidence rule in this case? If Reginald wanted to bring in a witness who said one of the victims at the Birchwood address had a feud with a coworker, or if he wanted to bring in evidence that one of the victims was involved in some sort of love triangle that might have provided <clears throat> motive for someone else to commit the, the crimes, that evidence would be properly excluded by the third party evidence rule. But so in answer to my question, the fact that motive just wasn't the issue that was being addressed by the evidence means that those cases don't prohibit it because they were discussing it only in relation to uh, bolstering a motive, a piece of motive evidence. Uh, is your question, do your more recent cases prohibit Reginald's proffered evidence? Right. Absolutely not. Right. Absolutely not because Reginald, uh, as, as I said in the Evans case, you said if it's the type of evidence that the state could rely on to obtain a conviction, we don't exclude it just because it's the defendant offering uh, the evidence. And that certainly uh, fits in this case. Uh, there wouldn't be an additional requirement. If the state had that sort of evidence, there wouldn't be an additional requirement that the state tie this other person uh, to the crime in some other way through DNA or eyewitness testimony or a confession. But in the trial court's view, when the trial court said third party evidence rule bars your proffered evidence, in the trial court's view, because an eyewitness identified Reginald, the third party evidence rule prohibited Reginald from mentioning the man he saw with his own eyes, with Jonathan, with the stolen property, who was also implicated by Jonathan's statements. And as we've discussed a little bit, beginning with State versus Evans, and probably more famously in State versus Marsh, this court has explained that's not what the third party evidence rule prohibits. But is that our lens? Or do we look at what our case law was at the time of the trial court's ruling? Uh, your lens is the um, law that's in effect now because Reginald's uh, convictions weren't final. This was law that came out. Uh, during the course of the appeal, and uh, you look at it through the lens of the current case law. It, what is our standard of review of the trial judge's ruling? Uh, the standard of review is abuse of discretion. And how does the trial court abuse his discretion by applying the law that is before the trial court? In the same way the trial court abused its discretion in State versus Marsh, because uh, when this court decided Marsh, of course, um, the, the trial in Marsh occurred before this court clarified that third party evidence uh, can be admitted. It doesn't depend on whether the state has direct evidence or not, that the lens, as, as you put it, is, is the evidence relevant and is it probative. And, uh, and that's why I like to quote this court in Evans, because I think that just puts it beautifully in perspective. If it's the type of evidence that the state could rely on to convict a defendant, it's not inadmissible just because it's offered by the defendant to prove that another person committed the crimes. And, and let me add something else. I, I know, you know, when I hear you ask that question about 
um, should we really be applying case law that came out after the case tried? I know you're thinking, well, the trial court's kind of in a difficult situation here. Um, but even though Evans hadn't been decided when this case was tried, Rock versus Arkansas had been decided. And the Fifth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment had all been in place um, before this court was tried. And I think it's I think it's very surprising that an experienced trial judge really would really would find that he could prohibit the defendant from testifying about facts relevant and probative to the case in front of him uh, simply because there was an eyewitness who said, well, I think it was the defendant who committed these crimes. Um, the third party evidence rule, as it stands now, requires that the defendant's proffered evidence be more than speculation or conjecture. Possession of recently stolen property combined with incriminatory statements made by a co-participant in the crime isn't speculation or conjecture. I've said before, I'll say again, this is exactly the type of evidence that the state routinely relies on to obtain convictions, even without eyewitnesses, even without DNA, even without confessions. Reginald's proposed evidence, I saw Jonathan's companion with my own eyes. I saw the stolen property with my own eyes. I heard Jonathan's incriminatory statements with my own ears was certainly relevant and probative in this case. Now, in an effort to convince this court that the evidence was too speculative to be admissible, the state has, in its brief, mischaracterized Reginald's evidence. I'm quoting from the state's brief at page 116. An unknown third party was in possession of a pickup truck carrying property that Jonathan claimed was allegedly taken from unnamed people who were purportedly shot and killed by the unknown third party. Later in the brief at page 119, the state calls it unspecified stolen property. That's not accurate. And I'll refer the court once again to our appendix number four that has Reginald's written proffer. When Reginald proposed to testify, when he made this proffer, the state had already established that the truck in question belonged to one of the victims of, these, of the Birchwood crimes, that the property found in Reginald's possession belonged to the Birchwood victims, that Jonathan was one of the intruders at the Birchwood residence, and the state had established the names of the people who were shot and killed. Reginald, as you can see from his written proffer, did not dispute that the property belonged to the Birchwood victims. Reginald wanted to explain how he came to possess it, and he wanted to explain how he came to be driving by the residence at, on Birchwood while the police were there. Again, quoting from page 116 of the state's brief, in essence, the proffer constitutes nothing more than one defendant indicating to another that some unknown, untraceable person was responsible for the crime. That's not accurate either. Reginald would have testified that he saw the man in possession of the stolen property. The fact that Reginald doesn't know the name of this man doesn't make the evidence inadmissible. The state frequently calls witnesses who testifies about who testify about individuals whose names they don't know and whose addresses they can't supply. Now I'd like to address the question of Jonathan's incriminati incriminating statements. As, as you may recall, the court prohibited Reginald from, from testifying about what Jonathan said on the grounds that it was inadmissible hearsay. As to Jonathan, Jonathan's statements, of course, aren't hearsay because he's the declarant. As to the state, Jonathan's statements were hearsay, but they fit into, and because, because Jonathan didn't take the witness stand, but they fit into at least two long-established exceptions to are, the hearsay rule. Are you suggesting that, that Reginald could have compelled Jonathan's testimony in his defense? No, no, no. I I'm suggesting that. Go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. 
I'm suggesting that uh, Jonathan's statements were admissible because they fit into we well-established exceptions to the hearsay rule. And just but, so we're clear, the statements you're talking about here are statements that Jonathan made to Reginald. This is, again, part of correct. Reginald's proffer of his own testimony, not testimony about what the girlfriend would have said. That's correct. Okay. That's a completely different issue. Okay. That's a completely different issue. Okay. It fits in because Stephanie Donnelly's testimony would have corroborated if, if Reginald had been allowed to testify, Stephanie's um, testimony would have corroborated Reginald's statements, but it's a completely And again, just so we're clear, the court did not say to Reginald, you may not testify. That's right. You're That's saying right. it was implicit in the ruling That's on right. the third party evidence that it was pointless to testify. That's right. I'll, I'll discuss okay. that in just okay. a second. Um, as to the state, Jonathan's statements, because he didn't take the witness stand, were hearsay, but as, as I mentioned, Justice Rosen, Defense counsel pointed out to the trial court, well, these are excited utterances, and these are also statements against interest, uh, two statutory exceptions to the hearsay rule. Obviously, if you tell someone, we just robbed and killed some people, and here's the stuff that we stole from them, that's a statement against interest. Under KSA 6460J, the statements subject the declarant to criminal liability, and of course, those statements were corroborated by DNA evidence placing Jonathan at the scene, the eyewitness testimony identifying Jonathan as one of the intruders, and Jonathan's possession of property stolen from the victims. Likewise, these were also excited utterances under KSA 6460D2. They were statements made while still under the stress of nervous excitement caused by perceiving the event that the statement describes. And remember, part of Reginald's proffer was Jonathan was distraught and crying when he made these statements to me. And the state hasn't argued otherwise. They haven't argued, oh, these don't fit under the hearsay exceptions. Instead, they're arguing that the statements aren't admissible because they aren't relevant, because they aren't adequately tied to the crimes charged. And uh, as we've already stated, the state had already tied the property that Reginald saw uh, to the crimes charge. And of course, once again, returning to the Evans standard, if it would be admissible if offered by the state, it's admissible if offered by the defendant. If one of the state's witnesses had heard Jonathan make these statements, those statements would be relevant and admissible. And now, Justice Beyer, your question or your comment um, about the fact that the court actually never said to Reginald, you can't take the witness stand and testify. But it's our contention that the court's ruling restricted him to such an extent that, in fact, he couldn't testify. If Reginald had presented a highly edited version of his defense, omitting all references to Jonathan's statements and Jonathan's companion, which is what the trial court's ruling required, this wouldn't have satisfied Reginald's right to present a defense. And the state has not argued to you today that this would satisfy his right. The state simply argues Reginald's evidence wouldn't have made a difference. Omitting Jonathan's description of the crimes at Birchwood, omitting his statements that implicated both himself and his companion in these crimes, and omitting all references to the man that Reginald saw with Jonathan, leaves Reginald with an account that doesn't answer the state's case or make sense of the evidence that was adduced against him. And in fact, this is why we argued that it prevented him from testifying, it leaves him with a statement that's actually more incriminatory because of the details that the court's ruling left him unable to supply for the jury. Reginald's edited testimony would have provided absolutely no explanation for why he had the property from the Birchwood crimes or why he drove by the residence while the police were there. Since he or could, why he had blood on his clothing. Correct, because, and that's the only bit of DNA that ties Reginald to these crimes, and he, of course, argued that it was his contact with Jonathan, with the other man, and contact with the stolen property that led to that small amount of blood from one of the victims being on his clothing. I thought there was some evidence, some other DNA evidence from which he could not be excluded. There was, uh, there was a mixture of DNA on the eyewitness's thigh. Um, that was, that's a, the mixture 
of at least three people produced a profile that occurs in every 16,000 individuals. So in the realm of DNA evidence, this is what you would call a very weak result. Additionally, Reginald's expert testified that the reason Reginald couldn't be excluded from that mixture was because of one allele. The expert said the number nine allele is in a certain position in this mixture, and that's why Reginald can't be excluded. She also testified 18% of the African-American population and 16% of the Caucasian population have an allele in that position. And if you're, and uh, Justice Byer, if you're also wondering about the, the mitochondrial DNA, um, that's the subject of a different issue. In our case, I believe it's issue number 15. We contend that shouldn't have been admitted against Reginald because it proved nothing. Uh, Jonathan's presence at the crime scene was established through nuclear DNA. There was no question that Jonathan was there. Um, mitochondrial DNA, as opposed to nuclear DNA, is identical for people who have the same mother as Jonathan and Reginald do. Therefore, the fact that one of these hairs had a mitochondrial DNA profile from which Reginald and Jonathan couldn't be excluded really doesn't prove Reginald's presence since, since Jonathan was undoubtedly there. And you still have the boot prints. Is there any explanation that Reginald would provide for that? The boots did not match in the sense of we can tell that this is a particular boot. Because they there just were no had scuffs. the same right. They just had the same general characteristics. So I, you know, so when this you third party had the same uh, shoes, the same shoe size, but it's just random. It's certainly possible. In good shape. Sure. In good shape. It's have to certainly be good possible. Shape. Um, omitting, let's see, Reginald's, uh, as I said, Reginald's testimony wouldn't have provided an explanation from why he had the property or why uh, he drove by the Birchwood residence. Uh, since he couldn't testify as to Jonathan's statements, he couldn't tell the jury why he met Jonathan in the early morning of the hours or why he took property from Jonathan and tried to hide it. Reginald's curtailed evidence wouldn't have provided any context at all for the actions he took that night. The most favorable interpretation of this highly edited version would be that he met Jonathan in the early morning hours of December 15th for a reason that he, from the jury's point of view is, well, he seems to be unwilling to supply us with the reason. And then he took a bunch of property from him, no questions asked, since he's not allowed to talk about what Jonathan told him. And then just by coincidence, later, he happened to drive by the residence at Birchwood. No one would believe that. Further, prohibiting reference to Jonathan's companion further in implicates Reginald. The state's evidence clearly established there were two intruders. Uh, at the Birchwood residence. Testimony from Reginald admitting all references to Jonathan's companion would have given the jury the false impression that his defense was that Jonathan committed these crimes by himself, and no one would believe that either. This abbreviated version of his defense would have left the jurors scratching their heads, wondering why he took the witness stand at all if he wasn't going to explain why he did what he did. The jurors would have rightfully concluded that he was a liar. And not only was he a liar, he wasn't a very good liar, N not knowing that there was more to the story that the court's rulings prohibit him, prohibited him from giving them. Reginald's right to present a defense goes beyond the right to say, it wasn't me, the eyewitness was mistaken. He also had the right to answer and explain the state's evidence. How did he get this property? Why did he drive by Birchwood? Who was the other guy? And he couldn't do so without the evidence that the trial court prohibited in error. And I briefly mentioned Rock versus Arkansas a little earlier. This is very similar to the Rock versus Arkansas case. Uh, that's the case of the defendant who, due to a state evidentiary rule, was told um, you can't testify as to things that you remembered after being hypnotized. The defendant in Rock was only allowed to testify as to her pre-hypnosis recollections. And this left her without the ability to relate material portions of her defense to the jury. 
The Supreme Court reversed her conviction, noting how the trial court's ruling had crippled her defense and noting that the right of the defendant to testify in his or her own defense is a fundamental trial right. Now, because the court's ruling, the effect of the court's ruling was to keep Reginald off the witness stand, we've argued that this constitutes structural error in violation of his Fifth, Sixth, and Fourteenth Amendment rights, both to testify and to present a full and complete defense. We've argued that you don't need to do a harmless error analysis. In the event this court disagrees, we contend that the error was not harmless beyond a reasonable doubt. Would Reginald's proffered evidence have made a difference? The state argues that it wouldn't because evidence of guilt was so overwhelming that even under this constitutional harmless error standard, the error was harmless. We agree that the evidence was overwhelming as to Jonathan. Jonathan's DNA was all over the Birchwood residence and on at least two of the victims. And as I've explained, Reginald's DNA wasn't at the crime scene at all. Even without the DNA, the eyewitness identification of Jonathan was unassailable. Jonathan had that unusual hairstyle that the eyewitness described and Jonathan had that orange, black, and white FUBU sweater that the eyewitness described. On the other hand, the eyewitness's identification of Reginald was very problematic. At the preliminary hearing at which Jonathan and Reginald were both present, the eyewitness identified Jonathan and only Jonathan as one of the intruders at the Birchwood residence. But that was explained by the change in appearance for Reginald and she had identified him before and after and the jury was aware of all of the variations in the identification. So the jury had the ability to decide that question, correct? You know, we don't think the jury got all the information the jury needed and if we have time today, I'd like to talk about the exclusion of Reginald's proffered eyewitness. On the expert testimony. Expert on the subject of eyewitness testimony. Additionally, part of the evidence about the pretrial identification in the pre-preliminary hearing identification of Reginald is a problem too because you may remember the eyewitness testified, I picked Reginald out of a photo array, States Exhibit 714. States Exhibit 714 only had Jonathan's picture in it. Reginald wasn't in there. And you know, I was thinking, you know, when you reference this idea that Reginald had changed his appearance before the preliminary hearing, that kind of fits in with our argument that Reginald was prejudiced by his joint trial with Jonathan because it was Jonathan's lawyer in closing argument who urged the jury to accept the eyewitness's identification of Reginald as one of the intruders by arguing, oh, he changed his appearance. But last night I was thinking about it and I thought, you know, over the years, I've had a lot of different hairdos in this court and sometimes I wear glasses and sometimes I don't. And I don't think anyone in this courtroom has ever been confused about who I am. The only alterations to his appearance would have been in the length of his hair. That's completely different. I mean, that's a completely different type of suggestion about eyewitness identification and your appearance here versus what a crime victim is going through. I don't think that's... You know what? You make a good point, Justice Rosen, because you're not under stress when you're observing me and you've had many opportunities to observe me. One of the things that the eyewitness... Plus we have your name on the docket. That's true. But one of the things that the eyewitness expert would have testified to is that stress, as you've noted, Justice Rosen, stress has a very bad effect on the ability of an eyewitness to remember what the perpetrator of a crime looked like. Do we have an estimate of time in the record for how long it took to get from the Birchwood residence to the field? I have no idea. I'm sorry. I'm asking because the testimony by the eyewitness was that Reginald didn't bother to conceal his identity anymore at that point. That was a long opportunity potentially to observe his characteristics. So we do wonder why she didn't recognize him then at the preliminary hearing if he was one of the intruder. Also, at trial, the eyewitness identified Reginald as the intruder who ejaculated in her mouth. 
but the weight of the evidence tends to show that this was a this was wrong this was a misidentification this was a mistake on her part because it was jonathan's d n a and only jonathan's d n a that was found on the oral swabs taken from the victim i made up in response to this third party issue when i was going through this thing i made a list of the evidence against reginald and let me go through that and if the state could look at it too as i go through it and if there's anything i missed add to it and if there's anything i missed you might add to it too so you can respond but it seems to me that we've got 10 things or at least i identified 10 things that go in against reginald uh, if we're doing a harmless error analysis on this. He has the stolen property, and that cuts, I understand how that cuts both ways, right. although some of the stolen property and some of the ATM receipts which would go against the proffered testimony were in the white truck, which, so I think that's a contradiction. We've got DNA, and you have, you try to make an explanation for that, but we do have DNA. We've got an eyewitness, and you have explanation for that. We have a consistent shoe print, we have his flight when there's an opportunity to apprehend him. We have the victim's STD um, that has occurred. We have cigar ashes. We have Reginald driving by and the police stopping him. We have the Donley, the girlfriend's testimony that they both left together, which con would contradict um, the proffer. And then, like I said, we had the stolen, my tenth thing was the stolen property mm -hmm. that was in the white truck which I think contradicts everything. Now, you know, I guess that seems like quite a bit mm -hmm. to go into a harmless error analysis and come out on the other side with the defendant winning on that analysis. So, you know, I guess respond to that. First, let me respond to the genital warts evidence. Uh, that's also the subject of a separate issue in our brief. Uh, the state argued as did Jonathan, once again, acting as a second prosecutor in this joint trial, uh, that the fact that the eyewitness developed uh, genital warts sometime after this incident and that Reginald was afflicted with genital warts established Reginald's connection with these crimes. In, a, in issue number 15, we argued that this evidence was grounds for a mistrial because it was unfair surprise evidence. Um, the eyewitness hadn't disclosed to the prosecution this medical condition. The defense had requested all relevant medical reports. The prosecution believed it had turned over all relevant medical uh, reports. Therefore, uh, the defense had no reason to believe that any that evidence of this sort would be established. If they hadn't been surprised by this evidence, Reginald's lawyers could have prepared to answer this claim. Because they were surprised by this evidence, they didn't have the chance to adduce evidence that 79 million Americans, according to the Center for Disease Control, carry the human papillomavirus, the virus that causes genital warts. Because they didn't have a chance to meet this evidence because it was surprised, they didn't have the chance to let the jury know that of those 79 million Americans that have HPV, many of them never show any symptoms. Uh, if they'd had the chance to answer this evidence, they could have asked if any of the other people in the Birchwood residence had human papillomavirus, um, they could have determined whether or not Reginald and the victim shared the same strain of HPV because there are 40 different strains of HPV. Um, and there was no evidence that Reginald and the eyewitness shared the same strain. Because the defense had no opportunity to answer this accusation, and because of the unfair surprise, and because of the fact that both Jonathan and the state took this evidence and ran with it in closing argument, uh, urging the jury to conclude that Reginald's um, that Reginald had infected her, we claim that the element of unfair surprise in this case also renders Reginald's trial fundamentally unfair. I think that, it, and it's true, Your Honor, we've never said that the case against Reginald was incredibly weak. However, we do believe that given the very tiny amount of DNA evidence, uh, the problems with the eyewitnesses' identification of Reginald, um, the fact that 
that Reginald wasn't even allowed to tell the jury what his defense was, um, there's certainly room for reasonable doubt if Reginald had been allowed to defend himself. Uh, and if he'd been allowed to fully answer and explain the state's case against him. Um, there's no right more important to the criminal defendant than the right to defend yourself. It's right up there with knowing what the charges are and the right to be present at your trial. And we believe that the fact that Reginald couldn't defend himself rendered his trial so fundamentally unfair that he's entitled to a re reversal of the capital convictions and the associated crimes. Uh, next, I'd like to turn to our issue number three in the brief. That's the Batson issue. The trial court refused to let Reginald use his last peremptory challenge to strike WB, who eventually became the presiding juror from the panel. To properly deny Reginald this peremptory strike under Batson, the trial court would have to find that the state had proved that Reginald was using the strike in order to discriminate against this juror on the basis of his race. Wouldn't, and, wouldn't you say here, though, that um, even if the trial court incorrectly denied the peremptory challenge, distinguishing peremptory from a challenge for cause, wasn't the jury that was impaneled an impartial, fair jury based on its uh, these jurors being passed for cause? Uh, we don't believe so. And in fact, we've addressed the composition of the jury in our, um, our issue regarding change of venue. So um, there was a mistake in passing WB for cause? We believe so. We believe so. And we think that that's, <clears throat> if you require us to show prejudice in this case, I believe that's the prejudice we can show. Um, but but how, how do you show prejudice? Well, it only takes one for the defendant. That's Both exactly on right. Guilt phase and sentencing phase. And how do you how do you show whether WB's replacement would would have voted the same way as WB? I mean, well, the state certainly can't show that. The state can't say that the juror who would have been sitting in WB's chair would have, by no stretch of the imagination, voted to extend mercy. That and of course we've argued in our brief that even if you find this error is harmless in the guilt phase, you certainly can't find that it's harmless error in the penalty phase. But I'd like to talk a little bit about why the court's ruling was wrong. Uh, and I think maybe I'm just going to skip. <laughs> uh, we, I think we've uh, fairly discussed in the brief why the court didn't even perform a proper Batson analysis. I, I guess my, the bottom line is what is the remedy? What's the remedy if, if we have a juror that maybe incorrectly uh, denies a peremptory challenge? What's the remedy? We say it, the remedy is reversal. And we say why the remedy is that? No harmless error. Right. And, and why is that? Because of the other jurisdictions that say, well, first of all, we're going to, I'm going to argue in a well, second. Well, the jurisdictions are mixed. Right. I mean, there's, there's They're lots of, in fact, it's, in right. fact, there's more weight against your jurisdiction argument, but I think, than there are for. This is more like prototypical Batson error rather than reverse Batson error, which, as you say, the jurisdictions are mixed on whether it requires a reversal or not. And here's why this is more like Batson error rather than reverse um, Batson error. Um, the record in this case shows that there was more than honest confusion about the proper application of Batson or the proper application of the burden of proof. And I do, I, I need to just say this. The state had the burden of proof throughout the entire Batson challenge, and the state was never required to prove anything. And I would be very interested to hear what the state would have relied on to show that Reginald was using his peremptory challenge in order to discriminate on the basis of race. After all, Reginald objected when the state rem removed one and attempted to remove the second African-American juror from the panel. So clearly, he wasn't trying to remove African-American jurors. That point raises the question of, if we assume we agree with you, is the remedy for us to really reverse, or is it to remand for a hearing that allows exploration of the basis for the Batson challenge? There, I think there is at least one court that did that um, because the record wasn't very well developed. But I don't think that's the remedy in this case because I don't think this was a good faith misapplication of Batson. On the record, uh, when the trial court refused to let Reginald use his peremptory strike against this juror, 
The court said, to me, it works both ways. The court was clearly referring to the fact that Reginald himself interposed two Batson challenges, the second one successful when the prosecution tried to use their peremptory challenges to remove other African American men from the panel. The comment, to me, it works both ways, indicates that the judge was kind of going, well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. On the surface, that seems fair, but that in no way resembles the proper application of Batson. To me, it works both ways. This comment makes it clear that Reginald was either being punished for his own Batson challenges, or the more charitable view, the judge had decided no more African Americans are going to be removed from this panel. I prefer to accept the charitable view. Diversity on this jury was a good goal, but in making this determination, the trial court in effect ruled that Reginald's last peremptory challenge would be race-based and not race-neutral as Batson requires. Reginald was required to use a peremptory challenge on another juror on the basis of that juror's race. The juror could not be African-American. Looking at it a different way, Reginald was required to use his last peremptory on another juror because of WB's race. WB was included in the jury because of his race, and the juror that Reginald removed was his last peremptory was excluded because of his race. That's exactly what Batson prohibits, race-based use of peremptory challenges, and that's what the trial court required of Reginald in this case. And that's why there shouldn't be a harmless error analysis in this case. This isn't a good faith Batson error. This was the trial court's determination that the jury would have a particular racial composition, which is what Batson prohibits. Jury selection is supposed to be race neutral. Counsel, as long as we're on the subject of good faith of the trial judge, um, are you alleging any other bias or prejudice on the part of the judge other than the absence of good faith in the performance of the Batson analysis? Do you mean throughout the whole trial? Yeah, at any point. Well, yeah. you know, uh, I'd refer you to our issue on MW. Uh, MW was the juror who gave some contradictory, or the potential juror, mm -hmm. who gave some uh, contradictory and confusing answers regarding whether or not he could impose a sentence of death. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that case, um, he, like many of the other jurors in this case, uh, he kind of went back and forth, but the bottom line for him was is, I can listen to the evidence, and if the evidence and the law require that I impose a sentence of death, I can do so. The judge struck him from the panel. I, I'd note that all Witherspoon requires is that a juror who has feelings against the death penalty say that, you know, in the right circumstances, I could impose it. He met Let me modify my question. Okay. Other than that instance, and the instance having to do with good faith on the Batson challenge, are you alleging any kind of bias or prejudice on the part of the trial judge? I don't believe so. I, I can't. Thank you. I, I can't think of anything right now. Um, Were there other instances of the court leading the, the uh, potential juror? It seems like on both WB and MW, the court actually framed uh, what was necessary to uh, confirm its ruling and then said, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And uh, were there other instances of that? Well, you know, we think that that was evident all through jury selection um, and that when the pro-death penalty jurors equivocated but ended up getting to the point where they said, well, I can consider a sentence of life, then the judge kept them. When M.W. equivocated and ended up in the space where he said, I can consider a sentence of death, the judge struck him from the panel. So we don't feel that the judge was very even-handed in the uh, exercise of his discretion with regard uh, to these challenges. And uh, um, I've often been, um, I've often, I spent a lot of time thinking about this idea of the pro-death penalty jurors saying, well, I can consider a sentence of life. Uh, you know, I, there are a lot of things that I can consider uh, I could consider becoming a NASCAR racer. That doesn't mean that I will ever do that. 
And um, I think, so I think you have to look very carefully at those responses. Well, I can consider it. I can consider it for about half a second, but I can consider it. Um, but getting back to the Batson challenge, um, we've, uh, we've cited in our reply brief the Pellegrino case. The Pellegrino case is very similar to this case in which it appears that the judge had just decided no more minorities will be struck from this panel and refused to let the parties, the defendant in the Pellegrino case, exercise his peremptory challenges in a lawful way. Reginald was clearly within the law in his use, his attempted use of a peremptory strike against WB. Uh, WB was, from the defense point of view, and as established in the record, not the type of juror that they would want on the jury. He and, had, and that was, and that was because of his strong views regarding the death penalty. His strong views regarding the death penalty and also the fact that when defense counsel were doing what they have to do in a capital case, which is let me try to determine how strong your death penalty views are, uh, and WB was also one of the jurors. I think there were, there were at least four jurors who served on this jury who basically said, if I convict Reginald, when I go into the penalty phase, Reginald's going to have to convince me not to impose the death I guess penalty. my question, in thinking about this, I came up with, with the idea, does it matter what a person's death penalty views are in the guilt phase, since that really isn't an issue in the guilt phase? No. So it doesn't matter. No. And so if we find some sort of uh, wrong here, would it apply to the guilt phase uh, verdict? I think it would because as I argued. Why is that? Because that's not a consideration right. at all during that phase of the trial. Right. And, and that was really was the basis, the race neutral reasons given to, uh, to strike WB were his strong opinions about the death penalty, which have nothing to do with the guilt phase. Oops. And I, and I know that maybe that kind of spreads over to the whole case, but tell me why that isn't right. There was another reason too, which I was getting to when defense counsel was doing their job, which is I wanted to, I want to figure out just how intransigent this juror is in his support of the death penalty and asking questions about this juror's support of the death penalty. As you'll recall from the record, or both Jonathan's lawyer and Reginald's lawyer later said, WB became contemptuous and sarcastic towards defense counsel. So not only do you have a juror with I strong- it was about why he supported the death penalty, not necessarily right. towards counsel. <coughs> but he, he exhibited a belligerent attitude, and I know Mr. Evans at least felt it was directed directly at him because WB looked him in the eye and said, made his comments sarcastically and contemptuously. So Reginald not only had a juror who he should have been allowed to remove on the panel with strong death penalty views and who was clearly a leader he was clearly a leader. He was uh, elected the presiding juror in this case. He was also exhibited uh, hostility towards the defense in this case. But the reason, the reason, I get to get back to your question, Justice Rosen, that we don't just confine the remedy to the penalty phase is because this is more like prototypical Batson error. And uh, Batson error is, as the Supreme Court has said, structural error. Which, requi which requires reversal. And, and I guess the little encapsulation of our argument here is, is this was the trial court requiring the use of peremptories to be race-based rather than race-neutral. And this was, the trial, this was the trial court requiring a certain racial composition for the jury, which is not race-neutral. It's race-based. And that's exactly what Batson prohibits. Yes, Justice a, Johnson. A procedural question. Uh, we have, you mentioned Jonathan's uh, attorney that actually said much more, made a better record of the race neutral or alleged race neutral reason. Can we use that? Well, I mean, I think this is Reginald's challenge uh, to the, uh, his uh, peremptory, but uh, can we use the Jonathan's attorney's um, reasons? In well, this I, case, I'm first not going to. I, the record might be a little longer with regard to uh, Jonathan's attempt to use um, the bat, the peremptory against WB. Uh, but here's 
Reginald's attorney. Uh, this is on page 112 of my brief. Uh, secondly, um, with the number of jurors, I have to shepherd my peremptory challenges and not use them promiscuously. WB, based on an answer on Vardyar, is one of the mitigation impaired jurors we have. He told us he was in favor of death on most, if not all, of the mitigating circumstances. He left blank. He gave inconsistent answers with regard to the same. After being questioned, rehabilitated, and questioned again. So, he, Counselor, your answer is that we don't need to use Jonathan's no. attorneys. Is that, <laughs> is that your answer? Right. Okay. And uh, let me also say this. he, Both he and Mr. Evans brought up the uh, sarcasm. Uh, Mr. Wachtel, Reginald's lawyer, said, lastly, in response to Mr. Evans' question, why are you in favor of the death penalty based on my listening to WB? He answered in a sarcastic and a contemptuous manner, why not? Counsel, this is not a racial revisit, challenge. I want to revisit um, the question just for a moment because your, your time's ticking here. Um, given the statutory requirement that we, uh, um, the, not the requirement, but endowing us with the authority to consider unassigned errors mm -hmm. and the decision to try these defendants together. Can we not look at objections on the on behalf of one for issues on behalf of the other? I, you certainly can. I don't think you have to in this case. Okay, but we got that answer. That's um, true. You wanted to talk about severance, and I, I'd like you to do so. Um, and I'd like you to first address whether a severance error can ever be harmless. I think um, I think that question kind of answers itself because in order for me to show you that the um, that the court erred in failing to sever, I think I have to convince you. Uh, that forcing the two of them uh, to trial together showed that Reginald, I'm quoting from Martin, had suffered prejudice to the extent that he did not receive a fair trial. Do we so ever... I think if you answer the first question affirmatively, then it requires Is reversal. it possible to presume prejudice? I don't think it's possible to presume it. Um, I think you have to look at the uh, two separate defenses, and I think you have to look at the evidence that was adduced uh, in the case by the warring parties, if you will, and I think this record is full of it. Um, but it's also full of compelling independent evidence against each party. Mm -hmm. You would agree with that, too? Yes, I would. And given that, um, um, Given that compelling evidence, hasn't the state met its burden? It's not relying on the incompatible defenses to prove their case. They're relying on the compelling evidence against each one of these defendants to prove their case. Um, that may be true in the guilt phase. I don't think we can say that in the penalty phase because in the penalty. So that may be true in the guilt phase. May be true in the guilt phase. Oh. Are you conceding that a really, really guilty uh, defendant's not entitled to a fair trial? No, <laughs> no, of course I'm not conceding that. And uh, but I think I, you know, I Justice Byer got me thinking about this question, and I think that Justice Rosen's questions about compelling evidence, I think that does go into the calculus of whether or not the defendant received a fair trial. Well, tell me how it does. The, the quote from Martin you gave is, is uh, uh, shows that the defendant uh, didn't receive a fair trial. Right. And you can have overwhelming evidence and, and not have a fair trial. Yes. So is it a fair trial that we're looking at or whether we believe the defendant's really, really guilty? I think you look at whether the defendant was act suffered actual prejudice from being forced to trial with a, a co-defendant with an antagonistic defense, and I think we can show that in this case. What is the measuring stick for prejudice then? Is it appears that it would be different than a harmless error um, measure. What would it be? I think 
if well <laughs> this is you know this is a question that i really didn't think about um Well, it's absolutely I believe the measuring here. stick is whether this court believes the defendant received a fair trial. I think that's that is the measuring stick, and that's what this court said in uh, the Martin case. Um, I think I think we also have State versus Fam. Let me um, let me uh, cite to State versus Fam. When evidence is clear and convincing as to one defendant, but not so as to the other, failure to sever may cause prejudice which will result in manifest injustice in violation of constitutional due process. So I think probably that's your measuring stick, your statement from state versus fam. Can you find manifest injustice um, in violation of constitutional due process? Uh, let's see. Counsel, I, 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 was severance was the third issue you were going to address, right? Correct. Um, I have several other questions about other issues. Um, is, do you want to wrap up your severance argument here? Well, uh, in, in, uh, with regard to the severance issue, let me point to a little bit of evidence that wouldn't have come in without, and this is all penalty phase evidence, Justice Johnson, uh, wouldn't have come in without uh, Jonathan's presence in the trial. Uh, the evidence that Reginald allegedly confessed to Tamika that he was the shooter in the soccer field. That was evidence adduced by uh, Jonathan that wasn't available to the state, uh, just like in the Martin case, where a co-defendant introduced evidence uh, that, oh, it was actually the defendant Martin who shot the victim. So uh, that's some of the evidence that came in only because of Jonathan's presence. Also, Jonathan's um, statements about how he, why he and his brother raped one of the victims. Uh, that was clearly Bruton evidence that came in. That came in when the state was rebutting Jonathan's mitigation case. And so that was evidence admissible against Jonathan, but evidence that worked to Reginald's prejudice. So that's, I just wanted to be sure to mention those. I guess I'm not, I don't, you said Tamika, and this was during the penalty phase, mm -hmm. said that Reginald confessed to her that he was a shooter. Right. How does that demonstrate prejudice as to Reginald when the jury still imposed the death penalty on Jonathan, assuming they believed that mm -hmm. testimony? This goes back to the quantum of the difference in the quantum of evidence between Reginald and Jonathan that was adduced in the guilt phase. Um, Jonathan's defense, his mitigation in the penalty phase was basically, well, I'm guilty, but Reginald is more guilty. That wasn't Reginald's defense. Reginald denied guilt. So in the penalty phase, he had uh, the right to rely on what we call residual doubt. Um, the United States Supreme Court recognized in, I believe it was Lockhart versus McCree, uh, that when jurors are asked why they imposed a sentence of life rather than a sentence of death, uh, one of the most, the, frequent, the most frequently given answer is, is we had lingering doubt, we had residual doubt about the guilt of the defendant. Um, and this residual doubt is doubt that doesn't reach the level of reasonable doubt that would result in an acquittal, but is often reason for imposing a sentence of death. To meek as evidence, Reginald told me that he was the shooter in the soccer field, that if believed, that would destroy all, religi re all residual doubt. Uh, which is the mitigator that Reginald would be um, relying on. And um, the state has argued, well, that's okay because the jury was instructed to consider the defendant separately. Uh, but this type of evidence, which is basically a confession, is the type of evidence that the United States Supreme Court said in Jackson versus Deno, if it comes in improvidently, no instruction can cure the error. Uh, so that's why he, we believe he was prejudiced in the penalty phase when Jonathan introduced that evidence in mitigation. Do we have any further questions of counsel? Yes. I believe Justice, yeah. Yes, I do have a few. Um, I want to talk about um, the crime, um, the, the felony murder for a moment. The instruction on felony murder on the capital counts? No. Or, oh, okay, the Ann Walenta felony yes. murder? Okay. I'm going to ask you a quick question about that. Um, could the jury, even if we assume that the um, identification is out, mm 
couldn't the jury rely on the gun evidence and the birchwood crimes to place reginald